Well, welcome back. This is part two. That's right. We're going to follow up with uh, what we started, uh, which turned out to be a little bit longer than I expected. But I hope you gained something out of it. Well, welcome back. Yep, uh, we're we're at the, we're just going to continue with what it was we were doing. Uh, we were busy um, on the very first video, but we got a lot accomplished, and you can just imagine what goes on. Look, if you get an opportunity, I know you you got the opportunity. Just subscribe, share us with your friends, comment below. I all I can all I can do is ask, and if you do, I do appreciate it. Thank you. Now, on to what we're doing. Oh, yes, we're in the midst of assembly. And uh, I was going to show you this while we were here. These sight glasses just screw off. Th these are really hardened. Uh, it puts your mind of a submarine in a way, but uh, they really are built very well. So uh, these seal up really good, but it gives you an opportunity to see what's going on inside the column as you're tracking the, the activity on each one of your bubble plates. So I've got these things cleaned, and I'm putting the bubble plates on, and I'm putting, you know, these are the downcomers, and I'm putting them you know, opposite each other so that they don't just fill up and, and drop down. So, and as I do that, uh, you place that on there, and I'm gonna put three, I'm gonna put this section of three together, line them up, because if you don't, it looks like ass when you're done. And, uh, I've already got the stills sitting here behind me, or the kettle, and I've got probably 20 gallons, 21 gallons in there, um, just about full. Uh, it took me a little while to siphon everything in there. Uh, nothing works perfect, uh, but we shall see. There we go. And I like to put all my clamps on one side. Just It just makes it look neater. Uh, you don't really have to. You know, something that was sitting out here that I was going to show you, what did I do? There it is. Um, this is one of those things, you know, we get off topic just a little bit, but a tip. You might have seen this sitting in the background in the last video and kind of wondered what that was. Uh, for those of you experienced, you already know. Yes. You know, after fermentation, uh, the first thing you want to do is try to degas. And degassing is nothing more than just trying to get the CO2 out of your mash. Uh, and the reason you want to get the CO2 out is because if you use any kind of chemicals oh, or any kind of clarification agents or if you just want to wait and use gravity and allow that to settle, uh, it doesn't settle as quickly or as effectively if you've got a lot of CO2 that's residing inside that mash. So you always just you degas it. And to do that, you, can ag you agitate it. You know, you use a whisk, you can beat it and all that. I've got one of these old, it's just a plastic tube that had a brush on the end of it that, of course, failed on me. So I just split it down the middle and opened it up. And I use this inside my fermenter to do gas. Um, I've heard people, I've heard, I don't know for sure, but I've heard... Uh, that people are trying to degas for hours at a time. It only takes a few minutes. So, yeah, give it a give it a good stir for a couple of minutes. Allow the foam to build, and then it'll drop. It'll reduce, build, drop, build, and drop. About three times is about all you need. Uh, after that, the more you whip it, the more oxygen you are infusing into it, and of course, you're always going to get bubbles. So your bubbles aren't going to actually disappear completely. Uh, but so you can knock that CO2 out of there real quick. Now most of your CO2 should escape uh, uh, during the process of transfer. So if you're transferring, you just let it transfer from a high level and let it splash into your secondary and uh, that should get rid of most of the CO2 and then just use a whip or use a, a, one of that big whisks and just whisk it real good. So that'll do it. Okay, um, I've got some other things. I've got to get ready to start putting this together and this is going to take me a few minutes, so we shall return. Um, I've got both of my pulse width modulators mounted. I'm going to move those over here so it's a lot easier to see what's going on. And then we are going to get at it. Well, as they always say, no plan survives first contact. Um, now, I've got to put these, uh, these braces on the back of this backer board. And this is the board I'm going to use to mount my 
pulse width modulators right there so we can get to them. Uh, so I'm doing that, and this is, of, co of course, this takes longer than you anticipate. So set aside a whole day. In, unless you're unless you're more organized than I am, oh, so let's keep on with this. You know, I get questions often about cleaning stills. Um, and you know, one thing that's really really hard to change is what, what someone believes. And uh, if you believe, and that's quite all right, uh, that uh, you've got to do a vinegar run uh, through your still. Well, then that's okay with me. I would offer or say that the only time you really need a vinegar run is if you have built that still yourself and you use a lot of solder and you've got some flux inside, then you can run a little bit of vinegar through it to try to, you know, you, because it's acid um, or it's, it's a really, really, really low pH uh, and it'll try to clear off some of that flux that's inside, which is a good thing. That's what you really want to do. Um, but other than that, in, in this particular case, in this still, what do you think uh, is necessary to, in order to clean this? Uh, some good warm soapy water. And Dawn dish soap works extremely well. But there's there is no residual flux or anything else from the welding process. It's all been polished, so you can save yourself that added step. Now, if it's just a case that you want to run it to see how it runs, yeah, sure. Oh, run a little bit of water through it, but uh, don't expect the same results as you would with an alcohol in it or, you know, a, a higher ABV mash because the boiling points are going to be different. Of course, they're going to be different because the boiling point of ethanol is different than the boiling point of water. And if you have just water in there, um, you're not going to see any activity until you get everything up to about 212 degrees so or 100 degrees Celsius. So there you have it. Let me finish this up and I'll be right back. Well, you can see I've got my controllers already mounted, so that's perfect. Um, here's another tip for you is that uh, it's not a bad idea to use a level when you're putting this together. Because uh, what will happen, invariably, you'll get one off cannon just a little bit. And, of course, the further away you get from the base, the more off cannon that becomes until finally... You've got the leaning tower of stills, um, not to mention the potential for leaks. And uh, once you get this all together, uh, is not the time to find out you've got a leak uh, because it is a bear, uh, of course, to shut down, disconnect, and then, you know, you follow, just do it right the first time. So I always use a level just to make sure that everything is uh, going together as planned. There, now we've got the the parrot attached. So for all practical purposes, the still itself is kind of complete. I'm using five sight glasses instead of six. Um, again, uh, I still have a height issue that I've got to be concerned about, uh, but it goes across this line arm and then comes straight down the condenser. Now, I've got the nipples for the condenser and for the deflagmator on the back of this still. And the reason I put them back here in this particular case, I've shown you those before, uh, but I put them on the back because I'm trying to keep all the hoses away from my electrical components and also away from the front of the still so we can kind of see what's going on. So now m many of you build your own stills and I think that's admirable and it's that's a wonderful process uh, and it's a wonderful project, but it does take a certain amount of skill. Um, and in making your own still, um, the only thing that I could offer uh, as a point of interest and for you to be concerned about is the flow of vapor. And what do I mean by the flow of vapor? Let's use this still as an example. Okay, when things start to get really rocking and start moving, um, think of the flow of vapor, the flow of air, and the flow of liquid all being the same because they are. Okay, it's called fluid dynamics. And so your vapor starts to transition up this column. Okay, in this column, this is a four inch column, so it's got a lot of area inside and it can withstand a lot of volume. And so it can carry a lot of volume of a lot of vapor. All right, so were you with me so far? Yeah, but once that vapor gets up here and it passes my deflagmator, then it is restricted but it's only restricted to a degree that allows it to flow across my line arm and down through my condenser. 
Now, here's where a lot of us make an error, okay? And the error is, is that they make the restriction such that it makes our condenser inefficient or non-functioning at all because it's not long enough. Um, and how, how do we know that? Here, this is the way this actually works. I'm sure you can see this. Um, if we just take a pipe, and let's say we've got X amount of flow, it's just X amount of flow, and it's flowing in this direction, and it doesn't matter, you can give it an arbitrary number on how fast it's flowing in liters per minute, gallons per minute, gallons per hour. That doesn't, the point is, is it's flowing in that direction. Okay, now this works with air, water, and vapor. <laughs> Known as fluid dynamics. When you restrict, when you put a restriction in that line, here's my question. What happens right here where the restriction is? Well, in order for everything to remain balanced, this flow remains the same, but it must increase because the volume is the same. So these, this flow is increased and it speeds up until it gets to this side where it balances out and becomes the same again. So this is the point that we want to kind of focus on. Um, you, some of you are, have seen, okay, you see you know, the pressure cooker with the 3 8 line that comes off the top of it. What happens when you do that? You've got such a restriction. I use 3 8 as an example because it's a really small copper line. Well, if your exit port from your still or from your kettle is really, really small, um, what happens? You have to build up pressure in order to get it through this. In order to speed it up, it's, it requires pressure. It's called back pressure. So it will start to build pressure. And so you're building pressure in your kettle. All right? All stills, large and small, will build up a certain amount of pressure. Uh, probably about 1 to 2 PSI at the most. Um, and that's acceptable uh, because a lot of things are taking place in the column that your still has to overcome, and those are restrictions. Uh, but when you increase the pressure to such a degree that you, uh, you start to cross over the 3 to 5 PSI, what you do is you speed this vapor up. And let's say just for, it's for sake of argument, this is that 3 eighths line that goes into a worm. That is of the same size, 3 eighths. And this is moving so fast that it doesn't spend an adequate amount of time inside the worm to condense. So it comes, so it do, it's supposed to come out as a liquid. But you look down and it, maybe you can see or you can feel pressure coming out of there. What's happening is, is your vapor is being pushed through your coil in such a, in, at such a rate that it's not able to condense, cool and condense and turn back into a liquid. So that may be some of the problems or some of the challenges that you're, you could be experiencing. Uh, so, uh, ways to overcome that, of course, is first is to in, enlarge the, your exit port and your worm, enlarge that so that that doesn't happen. Kind of makes sense? Yeah, just make sure you're trying to match it up. I mean, there's no magic formulas for this. It's just kind of look at it and see if, if you're going from two inches to three eighths, that's a whole lot of restriction. Uh, most stills you'll find go from a two inch column to about a half of an inch at the smallest. Uh, five eighths would probably be a little bit more efficient, but to about a half of, about a half inch. And therefore you will build up a little bit of back pressure, but it'll push it through into your condenser. And then you can adjust the size and length of the condenser to make up for the flow, the increase in velocity of the flow. Ooh. Gosh, I hope I didn't lose anybody with that uh, because it is a relatively simple aspect to kind of follow through. We'll be back. Now, we've got to put together. Um, the only thing I've got left to do really is to run the water in here. And I've already tested that, so that works well. Um, add my inline pump because I want to increase the flow. Uh, the rate of flow, once I get it out of that pool and get it all the way in here, I just want to put a, another booster pump uh, in the middle. So I can run that. I've got everything all hooked up. I've got to plug in my controllers. 
uh, and then we can get to running this thing. Now, it's going to take me probably six or seven hours, I'm guessing. Um, you sort of calculate anywhere between six or seven hours uh, to run this because of the volume that I have in here uh, and the size of the column. Now, uh, I would never, I would never even attempt to run this with a two-inch column uh, with that much volume. Uh, it would take God forever, uh, <laughs> a long, long time. Uh, so just remember that your, your column size uh, plays a role in how long it's going to take you to run because you have to be able to, again, we talked about that flow. You have to have a place for that flow to go. Uh, and if you have a restriction down to two inches, um, you've got, uh, you're going to have, you're going to encounter some problems that you had not anticipated. How, let's put it like that. Okay, last but not least now, um, because this is going to be another day project. Uh, I've kind of run out of time today. I'm not going to sit out here for the rest of the night with this thing. And that is I often get questions about uh, recipes. Um, here's my tip on recipes. First is keep it simple. Um, three basic items, uh, grains, water, and yeast, and or grains, an adjunct water and yeast. And when I say adjunct, we, what we call an adjunct is like a cereal, um, a flaked product, or something additional aside from grain. And that's if you're gonna to try to do an all grain. Um, you can use a different syrups, you could use honeys, but make sure you've got an adequate amount of water and then the appropriate amount of yeast in order for that to ferment. But all too often, someone will send me the list of everything that they're gonna put in it, and they'll say, well, what do you think is my ABV? Well, I'm not, I can't do all your work for you. <laughs> use your hydrometer. Now, that's what you have a hydrometer for. Um, you can just do a quick Google search and look up what are the gravity points per pound per gallon uh, of a particular grain that you're going to use. Um, and you can start to do some real quick linear math to figure out what is your expected gravity points based on how much you are going to put into your, uh, your mash or your wash. Um, see, there's so many variables that I cannot account for. So... Um, Unfortunately, there most people are a little bit disappointed because I usually write back and say, make sure you use your hydrometer. And I mean that sincerely because your hydrometer is the only measurement tool you are going to have that's going to indicate how much alcohol by volume you have when you put it into your kettle so that you can then calculate the potential alcohol that you're going to receive on the opposite end. See how simple that is? It's just something as simple as probably the most important tool in your toolkit is going to be your hydrometer. So, until we come back out here and we hook all the water up and I turn this puppy on, we'll talk about a whole lot more. But uh, I just wanted to give you an update and a rundown on where we're at and where we're going because this thing will be running as soon as I get back. Happy distilling.